Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to You've Championed Yourself. Who are you? I'm Chris Ferguson, your host. And it has been a dream of mine to showcase ordinary people doing extraordinary things in life for themselves and for others. Those who've taken their dreams and their ideas and turned it into their reality. They reach beyond any personal struggles, their pains, their traumas, where so many people give up. They lose hope. There are the few who can walk through their obstacles and their challenges, not knowing where it's going to take them. They just trust enough in themselves not to give up, do the follow through in personal life, their career and in relationships. And this is what I call a champion in life. And my guest today is Elizabeth Bennett, and she's a woman after my own heart because she's all about kids. And for 21 years of my 40 year career, I was all about kids. And so in my, my mind, my estimation, they're our future. Let's give them what they need. Let's enhance them. Let's embrace them. Let's love them unconditionally. So let me, let me bring Elizabeth in before I get all crazy over here. <laughs> Hi, Elizabeth. How are you, Chris? I'm good. I'm good. I, I it's know good to you. See you. <laughs> Thank you. I make you. I know your job. I had my, I had my responded directly to the principals in my position. So in that, can we talk about your background? Oh, you bet. Yeah. 35 years of um, being in education, uh, about 25 of them specifically in, in administration. And then the past, maybe uh, 18 of them as a school principal. And I've just recently retired from that. <laughs> However, I want to uh, continue what I've learned and what I've seen and seen and what I want to do to inspire young folks to be able to be leaders. And, and some of them already are as little as some of them. Um, but I, that's really the space that I want to do is to be able to be helpful as their voice for them to, for teens to be valued and for children to be valued. I love that. I mean, I think we should invest more money into our education of our students. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and, but because children don't vote, yeah. that's, they seem to fall through the cracks. And that's such an injustice that has been done for many, many years. Again, we were talking before we started about, you know, how things were, this has always been done this way. Well, it doesn't make it the right way. It doesn't right. make it that it's an effective way. And I was used to, <clears throat> in all the schools that I was at, um, we had traditional schools, but they would start at different times because of celebrations. And, you know, down in South Florida, they celebrate the Jewish tradition here in Tennessee. They don't, but they start in July because they have a different um, schedule because there's still a lot of farming that's done up here. So they give the kids harvest time to help out on the farm to, you know, help the family out so that it doesn't put them in dire straits. So I, I get that. But in all of this, when we pay more for criminals than we pay for children, our, our visions are skewed. I, 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 there's no other way to explain that. I'm not well saying played, we need yeah. to treat we it, it, I'm not saying we need to treat criminals bad. I'm just saying we need to invest more and keep kids out of prison. That that's when it's that's how we do that. And <clears throat> so what is your opinion on that? Well, <clears throat> I think a lot of it has to do with being able to have those conversations with kids even when they're young. So having having a space where families can connect with each other because that's what courageous conversations are all about yes we feel awkward yes it's uncomfortable there's all kinds of stuff that goes on when we're having conversation with people and sometimes we avoid having them because we don't feel like we have the skills or the strategies or or how we show up and sometimes that just doesn't matter and particularly for our kids I think what they're looking for is that connection. And although they do the, the attitude like, oh, well, my parents, you know, they don't know me, they don't understand me, you know, I'd rather hang out with my friends. And that's, that's okay too. 
but I think the 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 scope around it, the the and and not necessarily protection because that's that's a whole different place that sometimes is dysfunctional as well. But a space for us to be able to hold them so that when they go out into the world and they're practicing things or they have questions or there are things that are going on or the pressures of daily living for kids. Some people just don't have any idea what it's like for them. And mm -hmm. so for kids to be able to have someone to come home to, to have those conversations with, to tell them about their day, good, bad, or ugly, or whatever, whatever that looks like, that's the space that I want to be able to help fill. Because, you know, I've often had kids who have come into my office and said, you know, my kid, my parents don't understand me. All we do is yell. There's so much stuff going on. I can't ever talk to them. And then parents come in at different times and they say exactly the same thing. And so here's this chasm or this big void in the middle. So what I want to do is to be able to get them connected with each mm -hmm. other. And sometimes that means asking different questions than you would ask. That sometimes means, you know, being able to say, look, at I, I don't. I don't understand what it looks like when you give me that face. So tell me more about it. Tell me about what's going on in your life so I can help to support you. Not to not to be the one who, you know, tells you all the time what to do, you know. And and we can talk about that differently too. But really just a space of being able to say, "Look it. I just I just want to make sure that things are okay in your life. And if there's anything I can do to help support you, if there are questions, if you have, and not to, you know, not to swoop in like the, like the, uh, the helicopter parents, or for us in Canada, you know, the snowplow parents where they, you know, they boulder everybody out of the way to protect their kid. Kids don't develop resilience if they're not given a chance to fall down by themselves. You I absolutely. There, you can be there to put your hand out to help them up, to have some conversation and so, okay, well, what could what could happen differently? What could we do differently? How can I help support you? You know, so those are the places and spaces that I think are really important because then it gives kids resiliency. It gives them they're empowered to step up and step out and take risks and do things. I absolutely agree. And it, it <laughs> parents didn't understand me as a kid. Yeah. And, and this has been going on for years. So, so we as parents need to change our thinking, our mindset about how things are. I've seen it. I with the school that I was at um, in South Florida. It was almost an alternative school. These, a lot of these kids had one foot in the expulsion mm -hmm. system. A lot of them had the foot in that uh, criminal justice system, almost adjudicated as adults at 14, 15, 16. Wow. And so they had a different understanding. But when you delve into the family life, whenever something would happen and the parents would have to be called, mom and dad are working two, three jobs to help, you know, yep. support the kids and grandma's, you know, doing her best to watch the kids and the kids are just running all over grandma doing whatever. The one thing I always told parents, I would first ask them, please let me tell you that your child that you send to school is not the same child that you live with. Because when they're around their friends, they become a, an individual in that group or clique or, you know, whatever you want to call it. And they all of a sudden change. So the child that you send to school is not necessarily the child you see at home. And then two, <clears throat> the other flip side of that is I always would ask him, what does your parents not know that you did that you got away with when you were a teenager? <laughs> and when you think, it, it's it really, it is because think it, let's reflect back because it's like, what did you do? How much trouble did you get in that nobody knows about it? I mean, cause we didn't have cell phones. We didn't get, there wasn't cell phones on every street corner or, or anything like that. There was a lot of things that didn't get videoed like kids are being videoed today yeah. compared to what's going on in life and what you did as a kid and most parents there's they know of at least four things they can tell in their mind just boom boom boom, boom. oh man 
I need to have that talk with my son. I need to have that talk with my daughter. I need to sit down and say, listen, you know, I wasn't perfect. I wasn't a, 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 a model child. I got good grades, but that's because I wanted to get good grades. Mm -hmm. But you can still be, I had a girl that had a 4.5 GPA and she was my biggest drug dealer on campus. Yeah, smart dealer. <laughs> <laughs> well, she flew under, she was so flow, low, low flying under the radar. Uh, she'd been doing it for three years. She was in, in her senior year that she got caught. And so in, in that, it's like I said, who you know as your child is not necessarily who you know as them as a being away from you. Well, and, and I think, this, the, I think the, the same can be said for kids who show up at school who are different than when they go home. And here's an example for you. So, you know, if a kid is, has a dysfunctional home for, and whatever that looks like, whether there's you know, abuse or, or domestic violence, any other such thing. And they go to school and they're the model child because they just want something different. They want to feel safe. They want to feel connected. They want to feel valued. And mm -hmm. then when they go home, they, you know, they, they can get lost in their, you know, in their cell phone or their video mm -hmm. games or whatever to escape. Mm -hmm. And that's an unfortunate thing too. And, and oftentimes, those kids can't share with anybody because they don't know how to do that. Well, if they do share, it could cost them losing their family. Yeah. And, and that's a, a bigger fear than going through the junk. When you yeah. think about it, who wants to, who wants to turn their parents in? Who yeah. wants to, you know, have the police show up or, or in this country, it's DCF department of children's and family services. And put your kids in uh, um, foster care because there, there's no place for you. And that just give that's like that spiral that it just continues the craziness in their lives. Yeah. So sometimes I think some people think it's better to have a bad parent than it is to take them away from a parent. And I've heard that philosophy and I, you know, I, I'm kind of on the fence. It depends on what it is. And there's so many topics involved in that. It's like that would take a year and a half to try to get through. I'm serious right. yeah. because it's human nature, just human nature. And so in the way that you talk about courageous communication between parents and teens, how does that conversation start? Well, I have, <laughs> I have several strategies for it. And one of, one of them is five strategies for dedicated listening. And it really is about listening differently than, you know, because we just assume that we're talking with somebody and they're listening and they're, you know, there's probably 10 or 12 things going on in their head at the same time. I need to do this. I need to do that. So this piece, the, the first part of it is about understanding. So understanding about what's going on for your team. So asking different kinds of questions, trying to figure out and, and, and be okay with them however they show up because they're still your child. And so, and sometimes that means that there's a shift because you mentioned it before about mindset, but we'll get to that later. So it really is about understanding versus judgment. Yes. Don't jump on whatever it is they've said, allow them that space to be able to say, this is what's going on for me. So that's I love the, that idea. I love that idea because so, a lot of kids don't, they don't, they're not heard. That's right. That's exactly right. So with that, I mean, we're, we're looking at emotions and where we see those kinds of things going on. So that's when you can ask, you can be curiously engaged and ask different questions or different sentence starters. And some people, some parents don't, and this is not about judgment. Some parents just don't have those skills. They don't know what to say next. They don't mm -hmm. know how to sort of get in underneath things. So mm -hmm. that's a place to be able to have them start is the understanding versus judgment to allow your kids to explain things. So oftentimes, as an example, sometimes what happens is a parent will say, so, hey, how was your day, right? They're enthusiastic about knowing about how, what happened with their kid. 
and the the their child says um it was okay you know those four most of those four letter words it was good it was fine it was okay you know whatever and they're sort of in that apathetic kind of state you know ah yeah it was okay well what well what'd you do all day you know so the parent is still in that engaged kind of space uh nothing what do you mean you did nothing you were there for for eight hours right and there's that <laughs> heightened heightened yeah. attitude there with the parent and now the 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 child is getting into a space where okay i've had enough of this so up go the hoodie in go the earbuds out comes the cell phone and away they go now the parent is heartbroken because all they were doing was trying to find out what was going on with their kid's day. And the kid is heartbroken because the parent didn't ask any different questions. They didn't ask about what was going on for them. And so that's kind of, that's part of a challenge that, that exists with, um, you know, with that connection with parents and their kids, because they, if you only ask, it's the same thing as that, you know, <laughs> If you ask the same question, you're going to get the same answer. So shift how you ask. So tell me something about what happened in your day. Tell me about, you know, uh, did you see something that that you thought was really humorous? Or did you see something that made you, you know, feel uncomfortable? And what did you do about it? You know, did you get engaged when you saw somebody being pushed around? Or did you step away? And so tell me what goes on for you when that kind of thing happens. So that they, the parents get a bigger picture of what's going on with their kid in a daytime. So another strategy is intentional time. And this is really a challenge for parents. And it's one that I, that I hope that more parents take on. And that really is removing the distractions, getting rid of the cell phone, turning it on mute or turning it off or putting it in, in another room for a period of time and really getting being with your child and really engaging in what's going on together. So that could be like going for a drive because, you know, some parents have, have said to me that that seems to be a really good space. They're close enough in the car and they're far enough away that they each have their personal space. They mm -hmm. don't necessarily have to look at each other. So they're, they're still feeling like that's their little comfort bubble and then they can engage in conversation. And again, that's what with being curiously engaged with asking different kinds of questions or, you know, or even talking about a current event and asking for their opinion on it, because it could be very different than the opinion that you and I have. Right. So mm -hmm. those are the kinds of things. And, and you want to you want to be able to get that connectedness going. However, right. it needs to be with an element of trust, because if it's not something that you're used to doing, first of all, in the in the trust category, you can say to them, look, this is uncomfortable for me too. I want to try something different with you because I feel like I'm losing my connection with you. So there's the honesty and there's the vulnerability and there's the space where the parent is actually saying, you need to help me out with this. And then being able to have the, the child say, okay, well, let's, you know, let's recreate, let's do something different. I love that. I, so what I did with my daughter, <laughs> Nintendo came out when she was a teenager. And so we would sit, um, when, when, when my husband was working and I was off and she was home, we would play Nintendo together, awesome. even though I was I wasn't a gamer, yeah. but I learned I, I learned Zelda and I still play Zelda to this day. <laughs> but it was one of that things that we could connect with each other and we would have a good time. There was no judgment. There could have been a couple curse words like you know, damn and hell and that kind of stuff. But the fact was is it was we were connecting. And we would take turns because if I got through a labyrinth and, and I died, it was her turn to get through the la same labyrinth. And so we worked together as a team. And so this way it helped her to say, wow, mom, I'm having this issue at school. Okay, let's let's deal with this. So if you can sit in on non-school issues yeah. and have that connection, it makes it easier to have that connection on school issues. Mm -hmm. 
Well, because then there's a space of safety and there's a space of comfort. But the, the challenge sometimes is that if there's lots of dysfunction in the house and there are derogatory things that are said, whether, you know, somebody's gay or whether there's this or that or so on, or, you know, bigotry, you name it. If right. those are the kinds of things that kids hear all the time, then they're not likely to want to have any of those conversations at home. So when kids are dealing with their, um, you know, with a, a, a question or a concern about, you know, what's their, what's their lifestyle? You know, uh, are they investigating, you know, being with in a same sex relationship or, a, a, you know, or, or dating somebody, you know, of another culture? I mean, because many of those things are, are yeah. in the tumultuous world that they travel with. Yes. And so how do you have those kinds of conversations when you feel like you're hearing all that stuff? <clears throat> then kids back away from that, right? And so th th those, are the, those are the challenging areas. And, and I think, you know, if, if parents need to sometimes put their own stuff away, and mm -hmm. put it aside and say, okay, this is just a space. Let's, let's just have this without a whole lot of emotion, without a whole lot of anything. And just let's have some conversation. And see, I agree with that because I wanted to make sure that we kept the connection there. And uh, I'm very fortunate and blessed. She's a, an amazing woman. I'm a grandmother. And oh, congratulations. She's, <laughs> and she's a, um, she's very, she's a professional. She's very up in her area in expertise. And, but it wasn't, it wasn't even instilling that. It was just instilling the fact that, you know what, you can do anything. And as a female in my generation, and I grew up in the sixties, I, I turned 10 years old in 1969. So I was young and impressionable at that time when all this craziness was going on and all these blind spots of society norms was going down in life. And it was like, wow. And I looked back and I thought, look, think of the women that plowed the way for me to be able to do what I did in my career. Look at the, the women that had stood in their power so that I, as a woman, could stand in my power Back in the 70s, when I graduated from high school, I still had to deal with some of the, the um, in a male dominant career, mm -hmm. when you think about it. But I was always the kind of person I held my own. So I was physically capable. I was bench pressing 200 pounds. I was a beast. And, but I did that not to, to, to you know, compete with the men, but to be able to stand my ground so that I can support them and they could support me as a team member, no matter the circumstances. Mm -hmm. And let's let's face it, there's some big teenagers out there in the world. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, but in but I, I agree, it is about safety. It is it's about knowing that no matter what happens, my mom, my dad have my back. Mm -hmm. And she's always said that. She says, you know what? I, no matter what I did, no matter stupid things I got involved in, you guys had my back. If You disciplined me, but you had my back and you knew and asked me why I was doing this. Why, why are you going down this path? Why are you doing this? You know, are you seeking attention? And it was no, I just wanted to be accepted. And that was her main thing for kids. And I think for us, even when we were kids, it's always about being accepted. It's always about being friends. That hasn't changed in time immemorial. It's just now it's all videotaped. And I, I really feel for the kids. I'm serious. Yeah. I do because it's just like, wow, this is crazy. Well, and it was a real struggle when, when we came back after the pandemic, like after that first year, because most of that year, you know, our kids were at home and we were creating programs and trying to manage all that online and so on. <clears throat> and there was a, a diminishing factors from the standpoint of even <laughs> communication on Zoom because it wasn't comfortable for lots of kids. And now they've, you know, now they've got 26 or 30 or 40, depending on who was in the class. 
and they're all on the screen, right? And and you feel like everybody's looking at you, so you can't, well, that's the worst thing for a kid because they don't feel comfortable even right. when they're in their classroom and they think that kids are looking at them. They're, oh my God, you know, he looked at me this way or, or that way or what do they think and so on. And so all of those things are, are really heavy for kids. And so coming back after the pandemic, what I noticed was it took them a long time to re-engage because now they had to step forward and they had to take those little risks about, you know, am I still okay with this group? Do I, am I wearing the right clothes? Am I saying the right things? Am I showing up the way I need to? And so on. And it's just so, I, I feel for them because there's so mm -hmm. much. I mean, as adults, we say, oh, don't worry about it, right? It's an easy uh, throw out commentary that we say as adults. And it's, it's well-meaning, but right. what, we don't understand, what we don't understand yeah. is that's not how it lands over there with kids. Yeah, it's, it's a cliche it's, word. The kids that's don't right. think of it. It, it's, it's like, what are you talking about? People are dying. And they're, they're, it's all fear-based, and now their fear yep. is in their world. Their friends are getting sick. Yep. Several other friends are dying. It, it's all of a sudden a whole adult world for a child. Yeah. And they don't know how to respond. Yeah. Well, and you'd mentioned something before about families, you know, working two or three jobs or so on, and their kids are what's been now known as latchkey kids. I suppose it was before, too. I mean, both of my <laughs> parents work, but I didn't see it in the same way as what's happening now, because, you know, now they're working two or three jobs. So they're hardly at home. And as much as, and I've, and I've noticed that, um, uh, much more in these past years with people coming from places and spaces around the world, right? Their intention is to bring their families to a, a country where they feel safe and secure and things are going well. And, you know, and they're trying to work as hard as they can to give their children more than they ever had at the expense and not knowing, and it's not intentional for them but it becomes at the expense of their children because they don't have the time to spend with them. So they don't know what they're up to. And mm -hmm. then new family is created and it's not always necessarily a good one, right? So well, we have gangs or we have, you know, other kinds of not so great um, communities. Well, it, and the thing is, is kids get exposed <laughs> to drugs at a much younger age than oh, they yeah. used to. Yep. And of course, we, we now know if the kids are in a dysfunctional family, and I'm saying dysfunctional covering all of it, no matter yeah. what it is, and there's traumas and pains and everything else, they're going to look for that escape, yeah. those triggers to escape from. And if they can numb their senses, they're good to go. Yeah. I had a girl that was uh, into drinking hand sanitizer and grape soda pop. Oh my. Wow. And and it was she she her parents couldn't realize well during COVID, but her parents didn't realize that why they were going through so much hand sanitizer and she was loading up with ninety-nine percent alcohol. We don't yeah. think when we say, Oh, you gotta be you gotta make sure you wash your hands, you know. Um cover your cover your mouth and when her face was covered you couldn't tell she was inebriated until she stumbled or fell mm. so how the, how does how you know so there's more parameters here that that there's been drugs around since i i since in the 60s 50s yep. 40s 30s 20s yeah far back you want to go it's just that now a days they're targeting use more so than anything because if it's just like cigarette smoking back in the day the, our, in our country here, they, they politicized it as a social norm and this is a thing to do. And then all of a sudden it's like, Oh, you can't do that anymore because it gives you cancer. People are dying from it. Yeah. But wow. it took a long time to make that shift though, too. I mean, yeah. it was certainly We're talking seventy years. Seventy it was certainly years. the the same here too, because oftentimes cigarette companies were sports sponsors, and so you know you went to an athletic event or you went to golf or you went to whatever, 
and they were all sponsored by cigarette companies. And I think or alcohol as, companies. Yes, or alcohol. You're right, because we create some here too. Yeah. <laughs> and I and I think with some of that, um, I think in a different kind of perspective, because this is what I write about in the book, in a different kind of way, we need to acknowledge each other for the voice that we have to make that change. And massive as it was, it was something that freed us up to acknowledging that, hey, we can do something if we work together. Mm -hmm. And so that's the kind of thing, too, that that I, I want us to be able to connect with our youth because we know that the majority of things that happen in the world have been created by them. Like we look at, at you know, at uh, musicians and we look at uh, researchers and we look at you know, entrepreneurs who are six or 10 or 12 and making tons of money from things that they've just, they've been given the opportunity and the value, they've been valued for what they do. And so, and, you know, I, I just want us to be able to, to, to get reconnected because it's never yeah. too late. I agree. And you, and talk about, I had, I had a group of girls that were 14 and they were entrepreneurs at school but they were all HIV positive back in a time where an HIV had no protection. Mm -hmm. And they weren't telling the boys they were HIV, but they were selling themselves for sex. Oh. And mm -hmm. so the, the fact was, is it, it was crazy, but they had to, somebody had to initiate them, expose them to it. It's just not something you, a kid comes up and thinks about. Yeah. And so, but it would, that most people don't realize when you think about kids, I had the same crimes at this high school that they would have in any city, in any country of the world, mm -hmm. the crimes that happened, the strong robberies, robberies. I had girls um, try to file fall rape charges because they were um, blackmailing football players to get rid of their girlfriends and get with them or they were going to file a false police report. Wow. So it, when, when you see the other side of it, it's like parents, please, please, please breathe, connect, talk. Yeah. Because, um, I was a street kid growing up. I did some stupid stuff, but somehow I knew that education was my, my out. And that's why I graduated from high school. That's why I was so, no matter what was going on in my life, I wanted to have, I wanted to have the best grades I could. And if I can still that in kids, no matter who you are, no matter where you're at, no matter what your learning, learning curves are, nowadays it's a lot easier to get more help on learning disabilities than it used to be. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of after school programs where there weren't before to help kids get caught up. But the one thing in, in this state, in Tennessee, you can't drop out of school till you're 18 years of age when you're an illegal adult. And at that point you can drop out. You can't, it's against the law. Well, and I was surprised because where I came from, kids could drop out at 16. 16, yeah. Same and here. what a loss! What what a, what a, we're giving them an excuse not to be able to be competitive in life, unless we can provide them with other opportunities. Because you know, I mean, not not every kid is focused on going to university or college or a. I'm or, not even saying that. I'm just saying yeah. graduating high school. Let's yeah. just start with the simplicity here. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I, I've saw, I've seen a principal go to these kids' home and says, "No, I'm sending someone to come pick you up. You you've moved out of my district, but you're three months from graduating. You're gonna go. You're gonna graduate. I'm gonna pick you up and I'm gonna have someone bring you home every day till you graduate, because he was the first kid in his family to graduate high school. Mm -hmm. And so I never saw that in South Florida. There was no yeah. way. There was no opportunity. We came. We had kids from three different cities." they came to our school because it wasn't a community school. Mm -hmm. So I think that dynamic has got to change too. Yeah, it sure does. I, and I think that um, those students are the ones that end up being the most grateful 
or having had somebody be in relation with them. And I agree with that. Just being able to, you know how they always say to a kid, if you can connect with one teacher, yep, they can change your life and understanding on what you do. There, There's amazing kids that graduated from this high school that I was at. College graduates, NFL players. Uh, uh, there's a guy, the kid that was that became a national baseball pitcher. So there was people that were striving and thriving and they didn't have the issues that some of the other kids, but they were the ones in class. They were the ones keeping up in their grades. They had their coaches. Yeah. To lean on. And so, you know, that's a big, that's a big influence. But if you're not a football player or basketball player or baseball player, what else is there? Band, choir? Yeah. But I think even, even connections with, you know, if there's a, if, if you have a different gift or a different skill, you know, being able to connect with some of those folks, you know, like um, in one of the courses that I was teaching in CTS or career technology studies, they, you know, we created graphic design so that kids could make their own smaller version because I was not, I, I was not skillful in the bigger <laughs> massive place of it, but even having them do their own, uh, create their own games or create their own um, sitcom or uh, be a, um, a reporter, you know, and those kinds of things so that they, they got connected with someone because then I found other people in, in advanced skill where they could connect with those people to, to enhance their skill. It was the same thing uh, a few years ago, we started uh, a marketplace in our school where we had kids sign up and they had to write a business plan and they had to give a, they had to find some money or something that they were going to trade in for a period of time that was worth something. And, you know, we would work with them in order to design um, a platform for them to sell. And then the rest of the kids in the school would come in and shop. So they were selling things like, you know, popcorn and lemonade. Some kids were making jewelry or they were making bath bombs and lip gloss and candles and you name it. They had all kinds of stuff. And um, just recently I was at a networking event and a former student came up to me and he said, he and he's now in his early thirties. And he said to me, thank you for having that in my school because that's how I got here as an entrepreneur with my family because they are, uh, they own a couple of companies together. And it was like, wow, like who knew? Exactly. Who knew? Yeah. Exactly. You don't. You just yep. can just invest your time in every one of them. Yeah. And when as they best as you can. Yeah. And and I love the fact that you're the kind of person, just like a lot of people, that I like to see that kids can learn. To, they know you're not faking it. You truly care. There's a big difference. Yeah. And they are. They have their Geiger counters, and they can tell when you're authentic about it, or if you're just uh, BSing them and just trying to get play them. Kids are very intelligent, and yeah. people we don't give them enough credit for their their common sense and intelligence. Right. Yeah. When is your book coming out? Let's talk about this book. Well, it's holy. At it's at the next stage at the moment. So I've just sent it back to um, my writing editor and she has a couple of things to do with it. And then it goes to formatting. So we have the book cover already. They have to format and then and decide on the, on the, the, the size of the cover. Um, and then I should have my very first copy, my very own first copy in my hands, probably by the end of July, early August. But I want to do the book launch in September because I think it's a fabulous time for, for parents to be able to look through the book because their kids are back in school. <laughs> yeah. So it, well, might give, yes. it might give them a few minutes to say, okay, you know, I've had them all summer here and uh, it might be a time for me to say, okay, I need to regroup and, you know, check on my mindset, do some different things. So I'm, I'm kind of, the reason why I'm asking about it okay. is I've had, so I've had a lady who works in the city government and she works at the library. Oh, okay. And the fact is, is I'm I'm telling her of all the people that I've interviewed who have books. 
that could be a great source for motivation for other people, for kids. Sometimes if even kids read the book, they can help their parents ask better questions. Oh, yeah. So it's a different kind of way to look at it. Yeah. <laughs> but, but think about it because the thing is, is, you know, let's, let's admit it, you know, when, as you become an adult, you take on all these responsibility, you take on account responsibility, accountability for everybody and anybody in your world and then your job. And that's like a whole nother level. Yeah. But sometimes kids can help be that educator and say, mom, maybe if we talked about this, I could communicate with you better. Cool. So uh, when I, when I'm kids, kids are, they're miracle workers. I'm just telling you they're miracle workers and they have that ability when they want to talk, they want to talk when they don't want to talk, you can't pry it out. <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah. So when you give them that voice and that, and they're valued for, you know, what do you think about this issue or what do you think about that? You know, that those are the opportunities that kids then step up into their greatness. So oftentimes I would go to find students to help me with my cell phone or to help me with a program glitch in uh, on my laptop. And I'd say, OK, so tell me how this works. And they, you know, in seconds they would have it all done, but they would be gleaming because I asked them. Right. Are you, they taught you something. The yeah. principal, they taught yeah. you something. And it, it's when adults think that they're not a lifelong learner, that's when they stop shutting them. That's where they shut their minds down. Yeah. And just think, you know what, when you were in school, we did math, science, English, reading, uh, penmanship. I remember having a penmanship class. Yeah, geography, history. Geography, all time, history yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the thing is, is nowadays it's like with me. I did a crime watch program, and I didn't want to, to teach kids how to become cops. I wanted to teach them about all the other criminal justice positions there are, like judges, okay. bailiffs, clerk, courts, uh, lawyers, all these positions to aspire to. And several of them have gone. So my program was 70 kids in an alternative school, 70 kids. But I didn't want them to tell me what was going on. I was like, man, I like to figure this stuff out on my own. This is this is what I this is what, you know, thrills me to do. And but when they know they're safe and that you're going to do something about it, they'll say, yeah. man, Fergie, go back to auto shop. There's some craziness going on there. It looks like Cheech and Sean going on. OK. <laughs> So it is about being fair, firm, and consistent, but it's also being approachable. And I think parents forget that, you know, I'm the parent, you're the child. No, no, no. How about we are family and I'm approachable? Yeah. I love, I love that concept. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Or so um, you have a free gift for your, for the listeners. I do so. So they can, I'll send you that, or do you want me to put the link in the chat right now? You can. Okay. So they can go to HTTPS Courageous. I don't know if I could spell it right. There we go. <laughs> Courageous hyphen parents.com. And there are a couple of things there. So there's the strategies okay. for there are five strategies for dedicated listening and there's also an opportunity if folks are interested to have a teen strategy call so i, I want know. to be able to i want to be able to help parents with what's the one thing that's really driving you crazy about your teen and we mm -hmm. can they can bring that along we can have some conversation with that and then we can move forward and however that looks to help because all I want to do is help support families. I love this. And, and, I, and I love the fact that you as a principal just didn't say, well, you know, I've done my duty. I've done my time. I'm done. <laughs> and how many, Think about that. How many people who you know that have been in education that's retired and know, want nothing more to do with education? Two, I, friends I who, two friends who just retired just this year. <laughs> 
Like we were out for breakfast with them just last week and they are done. And I get it. I mean, it's, you know, sure. it, it's, it's long and it's heavy. And, and when you give as much as you do, there needs to be a point where you need to take a break and do something else. They might yeah. consider, you know, guest teaching again in the future, but it doesn't look like it. They have other things. I, I wasn't, I chose to retire so that I could do this <laughs> so that I, I can have a, so that I could have a bigger audience. And I wasn't, um, and it wasn't necessarily constrained, but for lack of a better word, constrained by a district because I, I had to follow rules and mm -hmm. I had to do things in a certain way and so mm -hmm. on. And, and it was a little bit of a conflict of interest trying to, you know, write a book and, and put it out there and help people a lot besides what I was supposed to be doing at school. So <clears throat> it was timely for me. It, it, it was at a time where I felt that, yes, I could walk away. I'm still healthy, wealthy, and wise, and, and I want to be able to continue to contribute. I just love the fact that you're still of service and oh. most people, especially for kids and parents, because as time gets more and as technology expands, this is it for, for the older parents. It's just going to drive a wedge. Yep. And unless those parents get to stay a, a learner of life, mm -hmm. it can, it can change. It could change the dynamics of their family to a better way. Yeah, it sure can. I so I love this, Elizabeth. You're, you're my hero of the moment. I, do. <laughs> Thank I you. do. I love anybody who will go out of their way to help other people because this is something that's needed. This has been needed for a long time. Because yeah. the, I'm, I, I didn't talk to no parents. I, you know, I and my friends didn't talk to their parents. They just skated through it and and tried to stay off the radar and stay out of uh, the the cop cars and stuff like that. So the bottom line is, if you didn't get in trouble with the law, you could get away with a lot. Yeah. Well, one of the things that's become tragic and, mm. and a, a couple of things recently anyway, but one of them is that the statistics in suicide is suicide is the second cause of death for teens. Mm -hmm. And we're talking like kids that are maybe even tweens, like eight or nine years old to, mm -hmm. you know, in their early twenties. Yes. And what is it that's driving them to take their life that they feel like there are no other options, that there's no other way that they don't see anything else. They just, it's so heavy on them and so limited in terms of their scope of even understanding or strategies or skills or being able to talk to somebody, you know, and that is devastating and heartbreaking for me just as you know, as an educator and a, as a person in our society, how is it that that's happening? And why isn't it? I mean, let's let's be honest. In my country, I because I think you're in Canada, aren't yes. you? Yes. Yep. Okay. So, um, in my country, there hasn't for years we didn't treat mental health the same way it should be treated. Mm. There's a lot of people in prison on mental health issues. I think if they had mental health issues, they wouldn't have been criminals. And so in that, I'm not saying that that should give them a free card, but I'm just saying that when we don't treat the causes, they get, they amplify. Yep. And that's when, I mean, we didn't have school shootings up until what Jonesboro in this country. Or uh, Columbine, and because yeah. that was in '95. So, but the thing was, is how come now? How come? What's getting into our kids' heads instead of the voice of reason? Well, and I think if we if we look back on that, like even in the in the the couple of incidences that have happened recently, so in in Texas and you know, just within the past week or so with uh, the 4th of July. Like I, you know, we, do we have the faction on television that looks at, okay, 
you know, that the argument about gun control and whether they should have them or whether they shouldn't or so on. I mean, who needs an AK-47 to shoot a deer, really? But, you know, and what are they doing that they're, that people are able to access them so easily? So there's that conversation. And then there's the conversation about how the police showed up or didn't show up. Well, in my experience in the schools that I've been in with our school district, we had the police come to our schools so that we practice lockdowns. We had the kids do them. We would have them, uh, the, the police department would call or they would just show up one day and say, you need to call one, right? And every and then there were others that we, we had to plan in order to give the kids an opportunity to understand the right. reason for it and so on. And then, so then there's the conversation with that, looking at why didn't the police go in right away? What was holding them back from mm -hmm. entering the building and so on? But then there was a space that was missing in all of that was really looking at that young student who did who create created this heinous crime but mm -hmm. let's take a look at him yes he's going to be incarcerated obviously but let's take a look at what got him there mm -hmm. so let's look at all of his life and take a look at that and say how can we make that different for other mm -hmm. kids so that this doesn't continue to happen but here's a, and being from the law enforcement side of a school, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I had to study all of these high school shootings. We had one at Stoneman Douglas in February. Uh, Nicholas Cruz committed a, a heinous shooting, and the one person of the staff that went running towards him was an assistant coach, a football coach named Scott Fi. And I knew him because I was a girls flag football coach at my school, but he was willing to sacrifice his life so the kids would not get hurt. Mm -hmm. So in that, <clears throat> there was I've seen the the the, uh, the Florida um, Federal Bureau of Investigation for Florida the report on it, and there was politics involved and th and that's where it just really just chaps me because it shouldn't be. But a year prior to this, when he pulled a knife on his ex-girlfriend and her new boyfriend, they should allow the SROs to file a police report because they would have never been able to, fi to file, uh, to purchase that weapon. And they said no, because they didn't want to see, um, people of color being arrested on, on behaviors like that. So that's why the report wasn't done. They should have, if they would followed the process, he would have been expelled from that school a year prior to that. I'm not saying he wouldn't get, try to get another gun, but he wouldn't have been able to get that AK-47 that he used. And then this, the faculty, I'm, I'm talking the administration talked about, you know, if there was ever going to be a kid that uh, commits a school shooting, it's going to be this Nicholas Krug kid. A year before he did this. And then staff saw him coming on campus when he shouldn't have been on campus and didn't call a code red, saw him carrying a weapons bag and didn't call a code red for the school to put it in lockdown to help it. But I know how I would do, would have to, to make sure all my doors were locked and teachers' rooms were locked to, you know, to practice this. Well, those are some of our policies that, have, that are put in place, right? That right. classroom doors but are locked. The thing was, is the district would allow the police to do, because it happened on school, yeah. allow that deputy to file a police report on it which could have prevented this yeah got him out of there and so do we follow the do we follow the processes or do we go rogue and and we want it to seem that you know it, it shouldn't matter with the color of the skin if he pulls a knife on anybody he's a danger to the school right so but that's what kept him in the school well it, and and from the education standpoint when i look at some of that I want to know what could have been put in place for him to redirect or be supported in redirection. Now, although he might have been 
uh, expelled from that school. Was mm -hmm. there an opportunity for him to have other kinds of supports put in place, whether it's mental health or whether it's nothing you know, was resilience? Offered. And that those are the those seem to be some of the missing pieces. Yes. That, and that's how our kids are falling through the cracks. That's one um, of the Texas incident. Um, the school board chief of police told law enforcement <clears throat> there was a barricaded subject, not that there was a shooting. But the door that kid went in was not locked, was not checked. The classroom wasn't locked. Why didn't they why didn't they call a you know code red in the school? And I, we had to study um, a terrorist attack in um, Czechoslovakia. Hang on here one second. I got the book right here. I pulled this out. And I, I, I don't know if you've ever seen Dr. Grossman or uh, John Goodick, um, but it's terror as Beslan. And it's a, it's a school that they took 1,500 people, first day of school, hostage. Oh my God. And this ha this happened up in, in, in Russia. And so the fact is, is that in this, I learned about this book. And this happened back in 2004. I learned about this book in 2006 when it was written. And the fact was, is it, it talks about how we have to protect the children because that's what they're going after. That's what they're trying to go after to divide and dis and and create a platform. So it's like, had that had the policies been followed in Florida, was there other shootings that it could have been? Why is a grandfather giving his 13 year old in Jonesboro, Arkansas, a rifle with his friends so that they can pull a fire alarm and then kill eight people because they were bad at, mad at a little girl for not liking them. We have to open that communication up. That it's more than it's more than waiting for an incident to happen. It's being proactive and saying, you know what? Not everybody has to like you, yeah. or want to date you, or be your girlfriend or boyfriend. That's their choice, and it's okay. And that's part of the courageous conversations: is having those conversations and understanding and helping to teach your children at whatever age they are. Because although mm -hmm. I focus this book particularly on teens, that's a it it could go from kindergarten right to the workplace because that's my next focus is to <sighs> talk about how we manage our employees and workplaces. That's a whole other topic. Um, uh, yes. I, <laughs> yeah. I just want to thank you and honor you for coming and talking about this because it this topic can be prevented. If you, if you have the protocols in your schools and you follow your protocols, kids are going to stay safe. Yep. And after a week after that Eulala, Texas, before that 4th of July um, parade, some other guy, copycatter, tried to access another elementary school, but their school was, uh, was the outer doors were locked down. And so it was like... Are these copycats? Is it? Is there an agenda out there with some, certain people to try to hurt children? Yeah, I kind of what, yeah, yeah, what I mean, think that? about that, you know? Yeah. Where, and then where did this kid in Texas get the money to have two $5,000 AK-47s? But they, I, they were, there was a, what, what, what is it? Um, yeah. And, and and two huge magazines, it costs like $300 each to hold 30, 40 magazine, it rounds in the magazine. So, it, you know, there's there's questions because his, his grandfather was a felon. His mom's a drug addict and he was living with grandma and grandpa because he wasn't getting along with mom and dropped out of school. So he chose an elementary school to pick on the week. We have to protect our children. Yep. So with that being said, I honor you. I truly, truly do for being a principal, for stepping out, wanting to help kids, even after you retire. And again, the website she talked about is HTTPS 
semicolons backslash backslash courageous hyphen parents.com. I highly, highly recommend to check it out. Her book's coming out in September. I'm going to probably air this podcast on the day of her book coming out. So look for, it will be coming out probably the day that her book is out and I'll actually put the link where you can buy the book when it comes out just to help support, um, support her in her endeavors. So Elizabeth, hold on one second. It takes a special kind of individual to dream their thoughts and their ideas and turn it into their reality. Elizabeth Bennett didn't have to, as an educator, as a, a principal, as an administrator, to retire and then continue to care about kids. I honor her for that because many people walk away and that's okay. However, those that stick it out and do things that are amazing for my heart space of kids, wow, they step past their fears, they stayed the course, and they had the courage to do the follow through. Elizabeth Bennett, you've championed yourself. Now we know who you've become. Thank you for sharing your ideas, your thoughts, and dreams with us here today.